Hello, let's spend a little time looking at a PowerPoint that follows along with the chapter on theater spaces and a lot of the terminology that gets used um, when you start working in those spaces. The first theater that's explored and explained is the proscenium. And as you see in this view from above, there's an acting area and the actor looks out at the audience and the audience is looking in. It's sort of like looking in on a picture frame. Many theaters, particularly the older theaters, had these gorgeous ornate proscenium arches. Gold is very popular. It's so beautiful. Look at these red drapes. Ooh. Other theaters, particularly more modern theaters, I'd say from the last 50 to 80 years, um, have simplified that proscenium. And as you see in this illustration, left and right, um, the proscenium has been downplayed. They're trying to make it disappear, particularly when you turn off the lights in the auditorium. A lot of times you'll find in these proscenium theaters, there is a space in front for the actors to come out closer to the audience. In this particular example, there is not. But when you do see it, as in this example, it's called an apron, which I suppose metaphorically you could say is sort of like tying an apron on you and holding it out in front of your waist. But here again, you can see the proscenium arch fairly downplayed with a darkened auditorium, though there's a little bit of proscenium arch there and they haven't really done much in the way of masking at the top in the photograph for this example. Scenery for prosceniums tends to be fairly large and picturesque. Um, as you can see in this example, big box sets, that's a term that gets used quite often. Or here, this is an older tradition, um, though it looks like it's fairly contemporary. What you have here are painted drops, cut drops, and the way that they all come together gives it a sort of three-dimensional quality. And then there's a backdrop in the back. So you get something called wing and drop. Um, looks like they put a lot of nice flowers into that scene. Uh, Another term that's used in the book are portals, and these are frequently called show portals. And in essence, they're like proscenium arches that just keep getting smaller and smaller as you move up stage, but they are connected thematically, visually with the nature of the show, as you see here in this set design, or this model of a set design you can see this sort of art deco structure going on here and then these show portals um, kind of mimic or echo that. Here are some different photographs of the Academy Awards and you can see this crazy show portal and because the proscenium arch is way out here, you can see these show portals that they use um, boy, is that spectacular, yeah? Really wild stuff. Two images of that from the Academy Awards. Looks like a bunch of bubbles. Or here, as in rock concerts, a lot of times they'll use mobile elements that'll come on and off, but it just amazes me that a few performers fill this ginormous stage and there are that many people that like to watch these things. The next seating configuration is called a thrust stage. And here it is viewed from above. Now you find an acting area that comes out into the audience, but also leaves some performance space towards the back. So you can put your scenery in the back back here, but your actors can come out and interact more closely with your audience. Here's a, a more detailed picture, a ground plan from above, and you can see how the stairs feed in to both the audience and the performance space frequently. And again, back here, you can put your scenery, but mostly the actors are out here. This is um, the Shakes, Chicago Shakes, it's called. It's their space 
on Navy Pier in Chicago. And what I love about it is how long that thrust is. Notice also here are areas where the actors can enter, but then you can put your scenic elements here. This is no doubt trapped, so you can get scenery and actors up from below. And then um, there's all kinds of space up here to fly scenery if you want. But the scenery in a thrust um, tends to be way upstage and very little downstage. This is um, the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Ontario in Canada. And this is their um, most typical traditional stage configuration, though they change it a lot these days. <clears throat> Here's an example of Chicago Shakes. This looks like Midsummer Night's Dream because it has this donkey head and a bunch of fairies here. But you can see how there's a bit of scenery upstage, but mostly it's all about the performers downstage. And here's yet another example. Um, without any audience, you can really see the stage, but you can see furniture down here. But otherwise, there's really not much scenery going on, just a bit upstage. It's all about the actors. And one more example where it's really clear that the scenery is upstage and the performers are down here with some furniture and props. In the arena seating, there's audience on all four sides and the actors have to come between them to get into that performance space. Here's another example, a, a little clearer, I think. A lot of times there are steps up to get this so the performers can step up onto the stage, which gets you better sight lines for the audience. But this seating all around tends to be fairly steep, so you're not trying to peer past somebody to see the stage. Here's an example of a set you might find in an arena theater. Again, the audience may come down stairs on either side, but the actors can step right out into the space. But there really is very little scenery on an arena stage. Um, it tends to be focused more on the floor, bit of furniture, and perhaps you might find some elements up above, but um, there certainly aren't walls um, or anything that would block the sight of the audience. <clears throat> and here is a nice example, I think, of that. It's tricky to perform in a space like that because you have to keep moving because the audience sitting here doesn't want to look at the back of your head for too long. The last performance space that's described uh, is a black box, which is very much the Jesuit theater. And in a theater space like that, you can rearrange the seats. And here are some different examples. Um, you can put it in a kind of a J curve or put it all down at one end, which is what we most frequently do at the Performing Arts Center. But you can rearrange them as you need to to create a thrust. and put your scenery along one wall if you like. Um, So-called black boxes because most typically the walls are painted black so you don't focus on any of the environment around you just on those actors that you're seeing on the stage. So what you find though pretty much in any of those theaters is an acting area with an audience that's viewing the stage um, and then when you spread further into the theater building itself, you'll find scenic space around um, the acting area so you can make scene changes. Um, and I suppose this is best illustrating what happens in a proscenium theater. Um, but then somehow you've blocked the view so you can have work and storage area all around. I like the illustration here. And then, of course, there's lots of space offstage needed for dressing rooms and storage and working. Here's a good, I think, clear view of a typical proscenium theater. Very large space. Notice how large. And this is a term the Brits use. They call this the stalls. <clears throat> and then this is the circle. They call that as you go up. Um, higher and higher looking down on the stage. And this has a flexible apron that ri raises and lowers, no doubt, through the floor. 
And then you get this offstage area here in the wings, which is what that's called. Some of the stage floor may well be trapped. And then <clears throat> up here is the grid and all this area up above that's needed to fly the scenery out of sight line. And this is the edge of your proscenium that you see there. So typically in a proscenium theater, you have an apron that brings you closer to the audience, although not every theater has one because in some theaters, they just want you to look into that picture frame. And here's the proscenium arch, whether it's decorative or plain. And a lot of times these theaters have doors that allow you to come down onto that apron, um, gets you there closer to the audience. If you looked at it from above, I like this terminology, um, the, where the audience sits, the term is typically referred to as the house. So you would say house right. If you're sitting in the audience, that's to your right or house left. Here's the apron downstage upstage again because that floor tends to slope in the in some theaters certainly in the past it sloped to give better sight lines so that down here actually was literally lower than up here but remember the acting area when you say stage right it's always from the actor's point of view or stage left and then they refer to that area off stage as the wings um, here, I think, is another illustration of that so that you can see the apron and then downstage left, down center, downstage right, and upstage and center stage. So breaks the performance space into a uh, grid so that you can more easily refer to where you want your scenery or your actors or something like that. Now, sight lines is a term that's referenced in this chapter as well. And I think we've talked about those. What you're trying to do is find the most extreme seats and make sure that anybody sitting in those can't see off into those wings or that offstage space or upstage where there might be what that other image called a crossover where you can get out and get from one side of the stage to the next. Um, <clears throat> so you, as a designer or a technician, would, if you're creating some scenery, you'd need to know those sight lines. So if you're looking out a door or a window here, for instance, in this ground plan, you'd need to know that your scenery is big enough that somebody sitting over here isn't going to look past it. So that's what the sight lines are all about. This is a sectional view, the sideways view, where it's like you cut that theater in half. Whoops. Sorry, I jumped back. Um, so here's somebody way close down near the audience, and then somebody sitting way up here. You can see they're very different sight lines, but you would want to ensure that the masking is good so that you're not staring at the lights or up into where the scenery is stored. So that's what this vertical sight line is all about, so that you make sure your masking is good. So here's this picture is a little fuzzy, but I do like how um, it illustrates typically what you'll find in a proscenium theater. You'd have your proscenium arch and then you have um, a main curtain that opens and closes and then you get drapes that run across the top called borders and drapes that run on the side called legs most frequently and you get sets of those with space in between so you can get actors and scenery in and out. Here's sort of looking at it sideways now. Um, an older term for this um, masking on the side is to call it a tormentor and a teaser, but basically you can see the borders and the legs. I guess if you hang a, si a curtain on the side, it's a tab but I don't end up using that term too often. And I don't think it's in your book. So just about finished here. Um, the older terminology again is that this, um, is this drape across the top is called a teaser and the one down low is called a tormentor. Um, I believe it was all about tormenting the actors as they would try to get on stage around these things. Um, but basically now they're called legs and borders. 
and the final image shows you some more of basically if you were to cut away a little bit of this um, theater and pier, this stage set into the theater, you'd see backing flats for masking so that when you come off stage, you're not peering off into the wings. Um, you'd have a backdrop and a ground row, windows, this curve, sky cloth is called a small cyclorama, and again, a teaser and a tormentor there along the sides, which look like fairly solid um, elements. So I hope that's helpful. The end.